faculty members will hold us accountable because we value you and we value your experiences, we value your expertise in decision making, and we want you at the table with us, especially as we advance equity by transforming structures, policies, and practices that are they're gonna help us together uh, as we work to reduce and eliminate disparities and to improve outcomes for all. We are also committed to leading with humility by sharing knowledge and power, by empowering our leadership at all levels of our organization. We as Ramsey County, as Ramsey County employees live our values with special meaning, especially today during one of the most turbulent times in our nation's history. We are committed to continuing to serve you with excellence, with kindness and compassion, while keeping you and our staff, our staff safe in this pandemic environment that tragically coincides with the social unrest that we are facing in our community today. I often say to my staff to stay strong, hang on to the people you love, be kind to each other, and we'll see what tomorrow brings. But today, let's get started with our virtual town hall. And again, welcome. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Song Yang, who's going to share with us what we can expect from today's virtual town hall. Song. Thank you, Ken. Can everyone hear me okay? Great. All right. Um, I just wanted to go through a few housekeeping items. Um, I think uh, we already noticed, noticed this, but the default setting mutes all participants upon joining, but we're also asking everyone who's not speaking to mute your line to um, just keep out some outside noise. Um, during this call, we will be taking questions towards the middle of the virtual community town hall. And if you didn't see um, the chat box, if you could enter your name, email, and organization, if you're representing one, into the chat box, that would be um, great. And so good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kasan Yang, and I'm the Process Improvement Leader for Ramsey County. And I also serve on the Racial Equity Community Engagement Response Team, or RESERT. On behalf of RESERT, I welcome to the voting in 2020 census virtual town hall. I will be your co-facilitator this afternoon. Experiencing some, actually, Prince, if you can go back to the disclaimers, I'm actually, for some reason, I'm not seeing the screen now. You guys can see me, right? Okay, so I'll just, um, I'll just read um, from, I think it's the disclaimer slide, right? Yeah. Okay, this town hall is being recorded and we are doing this for documentation and language translation purposes. And we will not be getting into specifics about uh, client cases or discuss private and confidential information about residents we serve on this town hall. And we just heard from Karen Francois, our Deputy County Manager of um, Information Public Records. Uh, we will be going through two overviews, the first of which is the 2020 census, and Jolie, our policy analyst at the county manager's office, will be presenting that. And then following um, that, we will be looking at the voting overview, and Heather Bessler and Dave Triplett will represent voting. And then um, the forum and the chat box will be facilitated and moderated by Lydia Germa, our policy analyst, and closing with um, Prince for our next steps. All right, so throughout these town halls, we've had some uh, town hall agreements. Um, if you could keep your device on mute uh, when you're not speaking, and then listen, listen actively, uh, respect when someone else is speaking, and please speak from your own experience um don't be afraid to respectfully challenge one another um, and refrain from personal attacks and also we would like you to focus on um the ideas of the acts of the town meeting tonight 
please participate to your fullest ability. Um, and you know, the goal of tonight is not to have everybody agree on one thing or a few things, it's really to gain an, a deeper understanding of what our community is wanting from us. And finally, step up and step back. And I think Prince always says this the best. He's um, an introvert, though he doesn't he doesn't play one on TV. Um, he's uh, he really this really speaks to don't be afraid to speak up, but also remember that there are some who um, are more quiet, and just keep mindful of that. Okay, and today's per, um, town hall purpose is to share the resources and services that are available. Uh, with regards to voting and the 2020 census. And then really, we really want to focus on the community discussion. And following, we will work to act on uh, and be responsible, responsive to the questions or any sort of follow up that is in the chat box. Now I will turn it over to Jolie. Thank you, Kristen. Um, my name is Jolie Wood, and as Kosan mentioned, I am a policy analyst in the county manager's office. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Okay. Um, so I've been uh, leading the county's uh, census outreach efforts for the last couple of years, and of course, we were um, expecting. Um, 2020 to be, uh, you know, all about, you know, the census and the elections. Of course, we had not anticipated that we would also have a pandemic to, to deal with um, the killing of George Floyd and the social unrest and all of these extraordinary circumstances that um, could, you know, easily um, divert us from some of these basic um, civic engagement, um, these important civic engagement events that are happening in our community. Um, could someone please advance to the next slide? Um, despite all of that, despite the extraordinary circumstances that we are dealing with right now, um, I want to stress that responding to the 2020 census is more important than ever. Uh, all the things that the census is used for it are even more important now um, with a public health crisis, with uh, social unrest, uh, with equity, and all the things that you know we we care about. Um, the the census is a critical tool for helping us achieve all of that. Um, the census is about counting everyone in the United States, everyone who lives in the United States, according to the first article of the Constitution is to be counted. It doesn't matter if you're a citizen or not. It doesn't matter what your uh, documentation status is, your immigration status is. If you live here, you count and uh, you are represented, um, even if you're not eligible to vote. Um, the census was initially intended as a way to determine representation in Congress. Right? It determines representation, not only in Congress, but also at the local and the state levels. So in 2021 and 2022, on call. Could, could you all please put your phones on mute? Thank you. Um, the census data is used to determine representation. So in 2021 and 2022, when they start redrawing district lines, and apportioning uh, representatives to Congress and so on, um, we need to make sure that everyone in Ramsey County, everyone in the state of Minnesota is counted so that um, the people here are represented equitably. Um, census data is also used to determine funding for things like schools, hospitals, um, and critical social programs like Medicaid, SNAP, and school lunches. Um, so especially in, in times like these, when people are experiencing food insecurity, when, ex when people are experiencing income insecurity, um, we depend on these programs more than ever. And to ensure that we have adequate funding for any future um, periods of, of crisis, we need to make sure that everyone is counted. So, so please um, you know, respond to the census, encourage your friends, encourage your neighbors to do so. Um, I would like to, uh, well, after this one last point, I would like to ask uh, Prince to um, share a map. But before we go there, 
I want to emphasize that when you respond um, to the census and give your personal data, that data is completely confidential. It is highly protected. Um, it cannot be shared with other government agencies. It cannot be shared with the IRS or the CIA or the FBI or um, you know, Department of Homeland Security or anyone else. It cannot be used as evidence in court. Um, it cannot be shared in any way. And the penalties, so if a census worker were to divulge any of your personal information, the penalties are severe. That employee could land in jail for five years. It could be hit with a $250,000 fine. Um, and, and so employees are highly motivated to keep your personal data private. Um, what does become public are statistics, and we need those statistics for all of the reasons that I mentioned. Um, Prince, could we just quickly jump over to that map? So this is the census uh, website, um, the Census Bureau's response rate website, and any one of you can go here to see uh, what the response rates are state by state, county by county, and census tract by census tract. And as you can see, Minnesota overall is doing very well with a 70.5% response rate. Now Prince is gonna take us to uh, Ramsey County and then to the census tracts in Ramsey County. So as you can see, the, the counties here are color coded. The darker the blue, the higher the response rate. And there's Ramsey County with a 74.3 response rate so far. Overall, pretty good, but that still means that over 25% of our people are not responding. And here are our census tracts. Census tracts are just uh, geographical areas, roughly uh, about five to 15,000 people per census tract. And as you can see, um, the darker areas with the higher response rates are more in northern Rancho County. They've been doing very well with high response rates in the 80s and 90s. Um, in St. Paul, we're seeing uh, still some lower response rates, especially in those areas with, uh, that are lighter colored. And um, I just want to point out that those areas tend to be over on the east side, on the north end. Um, in the University Summit area, University and Dale. I'm just pointing this out so that if you live in these areas or you know people who live in these areas, please talk to your neighbors, please talk to your friends and family about responding to the census um, so that we can make sure that everyone in these areas are counted. Thank you, Prince. Can we go back to the PowerPoint? So I'm just going to now say a few things about how the Census Bureau has um, adjusted to the current pandemic, how they have um, made some operational changes. They've adjusted their timeline. So um, with regard to the timeline, it's June now. And under normal circumstances, census workers would have gone out this month to start knocking on people's doors. Usually what they do is they just visit those households that haven't yet responded um, on the census. They haven't yet self-responded or self-reported. Um, so what they're doing now is that the timeline has been pushed back so that those census workers won't go out until mid-August. Um, so that means that you know, we still don't really know like, how many people are going to be uh, left to be counted. Um, when census workers start going out. We want to ensure that, you know, that as many people are counted as possible by themselves. We want to encourage people to self-respond so that census workers don't have to follow up with, you know, 30% or 25% of households. Um, they will be wearing protective gear and they will be trained to minimize contact, but a lot of people are probably um, wary about having people knock on their doors, even under the best of circumstances, even in the best of times. With a public health crisis, people are going to be even more cautious. So we're concerned that even when the Census Bureau starts following up with people, people are not gonna be opening their doors. 
So we want to strongly encourage you, if you don't want someone knocking on your door in August, please send in your paper form or go online to 20, my2020census.gov to, to respond. You can also call and respond over the phone. And the Census Bureau does offer um, different phone numbers for people speaking different languages, um, including Spanish, Chinese, and Vietnamese, and a few other languages. Um, if you want any more information about this, please don't hesitate to contact me. Um, I'm happy to respond to your emails or your phone calls. You can also uh, go online to Ramsey County's uh, census page and fill in the form to contact me if you have any questions about this. And that's, that's all I have for now. All right, and we'll hold questions now and um, go to the voting overview. And Dave Triplett and Heather Bessler are representing voting, but I believe there are many other staff that can help answer questions when we get to the discussion part of the town hall. Great, thanks, Kassan. Uh, and thanks everybody for attending uh, this town hall today. This is a uh, good opportunity for our staff too to kind of answer questions that we know a lot of the public has. So, um, obviously, uh, the presidential election years are our busiest election years in the four-year cycle, and we spend uh, most of our year uh, planning for the presidential election. Uh, and what we don't plan for is running an election during a pandemic. So um, we're here to talk today about um, kind of what our plans are to provide a safe voting experience and let all you know uh, what their options are. Uh, but also to get feedback from you to know um, what, what things we might be able to do to best serve you. Um, so for those of you who have been paying attention to the elections that have been conducted uh, nationwide since COVID, um, you might have some concerns or some questions about how we're going to provide that opportunity. Um, a lot of states have either adjusted their laws or have not adjusted their laws, and I think that's what you're seeing in a lot of these other states. Uh, so we want to use today's opportunity to kind of let you know what we're planning to do, uh, and then again get that feedback. Um, so for Minnesota, for those of you who um, follow the legislature, you're probably aware of this, but for those of you who don't, um, there was a safe and secure election bill passed and signed by the governor in early May. Um, a lot of the bill focused on administrative uh, functions of elections, not the functions voters will see. Uh, so for most people, your voting experience um, won't be dramatically different um, than it has normally been. Uh, but what we want to do today is inform you of all the options you have. So if you don't want to show up in person, uh, what options do you have to vote safely? And then for those who are going to show, choose to vote in person or need to vote in person, uh, we want to let you know what we're going to do to keep you safe and keep our election agenda safe. Uh, so that's uh, what I'm here to talk about uh, right now. Um, so if we can go to the slide about uh, absentee voting. Um, this is probably the most... Um, visible part of voting in um, a pandemic. You had a lot of states, uh, Idaho, California, who moved to all mail voting. Um, so there are some conceptions that Minnesota moved to all mail voting. So we did not. Minnesota has what's called no excuse absentee voting. So in Minnesota, you don't need to have an excuse to vote by mail. If you fill out an application uh, and we verify that application, uh, we will send you a ballot. So what we want to do is we want to um, inform uh, our residents of this option. Uh, historically, about 20% of our voters will vote before election day, uh, either in person or through the mail. Uh, and we want to let all our voters know um, that if you do not feel safe showing up in person, uh, that you can vote by mail for no reason. Uh, you fill out the application, uh, you're a registered voter or you register, uh, and we will mail you that ballot. So what you're seeing on the screen here is kind of our communication branding. Uh, we are really doing a, a, a full force communication strategy, social media, mailings, radio, print advertisement to really inform voters about what your options are uh, to vote through the mail or to vote in person. So voting always starts 46 days before an election. That is state law. So for the Mar or for the August 14th or August 11th primary, excuse me, uh, voting will start on June 26th, so that's about two and a half weeks away. Um, we will have three in-person locations open for the entire 46-day period uh, where you can show up. But what also happens on June 26th is we can start mailing ballots to any voters uh, who've requested them. Uh, and requesting a ballot through the mail uh, is very easy. You can do that online, uh, or you can call our office, 
or request an application to be mailed to you. Um, with that said, uh, to vote through the mail, you do have to fill out an application. Again, that can be done at mnvotes.org. It can be done at our website, ramseycounty.us uh, slash vote by mail, uh, or it can be done on a paper application. Um, those can be requested from our office and we'll mail one to you. Uh, they can be printed off our website, or I'm sure as a lot of you have been noticing, uh, you're getting these just showing up in your mailbox from third party groups or campaigns. Uh, so anybody can distribute an application uh, but it must be submitted to either the Secretary of State's office uh, or um, your local election office. So in Ramsey County, uh, that would be um, our office here at the Plato Building. Um, we will be accept those will uh, those are out there now. So for those of you who already know you want to vote by mail, you can uh, request those today. And I will say our uh, incoming mail with these requests uh, is growing rapidly uh, every day. Um, with that said, with mail voting, um, some of the questions we get a lot is, well, I don't have a permanent address I'm always, I don't know where I'm gonna be staying in August. You can choose to have the ballot mailed wherever you like. So you do have to have a registered, uh, an active registration at a address at, in a precinct. Uh, but if you're living somewhere else or you want your ballot sent somewhere else, you can tell us on that application where you would like your ballot to be sent. Uh, so for those of you who will be out of the precinct or out of the state uh, or are unsure exactly where you might be spending um, the night previous to election, uh, you can indicate where that could be. So that could be a PO box. Uh, it could be, um, you know, so a, a different residence that you happen to be staying, uh, but your registration does need to be active uh, at a residential address. Um, to vote by absentee ballot, you do need a witness. So if we mail you a ballot, you do need a witness to sign off on your um, on your outer envelope proving that, yep, you are who you say you are and you did receive a blank ballot. Uh, that witness just has to have been a registered voter in the state of Minnesota. Um, but with that said, some folks might uh, struggle to find someone to witness their ballot. So if you are unable to find someone to witness your ballot, uh, you can always come to our office in person uh, and we will act as a witness. Uh, or you can come to one of these three uh, early voting uh, locations that's listed on the slide here, uh, and we will witness your ballot there. If you have other hurdles um, that don't allow you to get to one of these locations, I would encourage you to call our office. Um, the number isn't on here, I believe it's on the final slide. Uh, but if you call our office, we can work with you to get an accommodation so we can get someone out to witness your ballot uh, for you. With that said, I think everybody realizes with COVID, it is changing day to day, uh, and there is a lawsuit before the state courts um, uh, to remove the witness requirement. Um, so as of now, the witness is a requirement, but you might be hearing news stories uh, that uh, are discussing the removal of that witness requirement. Uh, and if that's the case, we will reflect that uh, in our outreach and our communication. But as of today, uh, you do need a witness if you choose to vote by mail. Um, for those folks who want to vote by mail but need translation services, or um, if you want to vote by mail but you need some accessible services, uh, those are available either at the in-person locations you see there. So we will have uh, Hmong, Somali, uh, and Spanish translations available at these locations. And we also have Karen translations and a few other of our um, uh, East African languages too available. Um, and then we always have translation available over the phone. So if you're unable to get to one of these locations, you can always call our office uh, and we will work our best to uh, help provide those translation services. Uh, and then for accessibility services, uh, state law or federal law, excuse me, does require that an accessible device be available for every voter uh, to mark their ballot independently. So again, we have these devices available at these locations. Uh, or if you're unable to get to one of these locations, you can always call our office and we can make an accommodation uh, to potentially send a team of judges uh, to help you uh, complete that task. Um, so I guess what I'm saying with a lot of this is uh, if, if, if you're on our website or you're getting information and you're not seeing exactly what uh, you need, uh, give us a call because uh, we, could, um, we can make some accommodations to make sure that you meet the letter of the law and then are able to exercise your right to vote. Um, so that's kind of the information about voting before election day, either through the mail uh, or in person. And obviously I think what we're seeing from a lot of states that have been conducting elections is that people are very much taking advantage of the vote by mail. And in Minnesota, unlike a lot of states, you do not need an excuse to vote through the mail. If you request a ballot through the mail and are registered or complete a registration, 
uh, you will get a ballot mailed to you once you complete your fee application. Um, but those, for, for those of you who would uh, do like to vote on election day or choose to vote on election day or need to vote on election day, um, this is what we're going to do to ensure your safety and ensure the safety of our election judges. Um, a lot of this is ongoing and we're still procuring PPE and still analyzing some of our processes to minimize as many touches as possible, but still meet the letter of the law because a lot of the duties in elections are statute driven. And so we need to make sure that we're upholding um, state law as well. Um, but at our, our, our election day polling places, we really wanna provide that safe voting experience um, for again, our voters and our election judges. So we will be implementing public health uh, standards around social distancing. Uh, trying to keep people obviously at that six feet. Uh, we will be providing hand sanitizer stations when you enter the polling place, when you exit the polling place, and variously uh, spread throughout the polling place, especially where you actually have to make an interaction with our judge. Uh, we will heavily encourage you to uh, uh, keep, keep your hands clean. And then for our election judges, we will be requiring them to regularly sanitize their hands or go and wash their hands. Uh, our election judges will be uh, required to wear masks, uh, so we will be providing all our judges uh, two cloth masks for the day, uh, as well as in our messaging, uh, messaging that will be going out in a few uh, weeks here, uh, encouraging judges to wear their own masks. Uh, if they want their own. I think masks are becoming fairly common, so I, I'm pretty confident most of our judges will have them, uh, but if we don't, we will provide them. Uh, we will also be providing masks for voters who choose to wear one and have not arrived. Um, I do want to say to everybody, uh, wearing a mask is not a requirement to vote. Uh, we can only enforce the eligibility requirements, which are being 18, a U.S. citizen, uh, and a resident of Minnesota for 20 days, uh, and have no um, guardianship or uh, court-ordered restrictions on your voting record. That's all we can enforce, but we are going to heavily encourage our uh, voters to also be wearing a mask. So when you enter the polling place where that hand sanitizer station is, we will also have a supply of single-use masks, as well as a single-use pen. So when voters show up, uh, either outside of the polling place, or obviously November is going to be uh, maybe snowy and cold, right when you enter the polling place, you're going to see a sign informing you of these standards, and then encouraging you to sanitize your hands, take a mask, and take that pen. And that pen is going to be the pen you're going to use for your entire voting experience. The other thing we're doing to um, provide safety is we will have shields up. Obviously, we have some voters who need to communicate via reading lips, and if all our judges are wearing a mask, uh, it will be difficult to communicate. So we do have shields that we're gonna provide. So for folks who need to read lips to communicate, our judges can remove that mask and then you can talk behind the shield. Uh, we also have the shields available for um, various stations where you will have to you can exchange a ballot. Um, we also have the shields available for translation or, or assistance because when you're sitting down with a voter to assist them with their ballot or translate the ballot, uh, that takes a little more time uh, and generally is in a, in a tighter space. So we're going to provide these shields for that activity uh, as well. Uh, but also we have reviewed some of our processes where we can maybe remove some touches. So for example, for those of you who vote in person, we now use electronic poll books we used to have the voters make some selections. Now the judges will make selections, turn it, you'll confirm it, the receipt will print out, the voter will rip their receipt, sign it, uh, and then that will remove the need of the judges and the voters to have to make that exchange. Um, but there are some processes at the polling place that state law says two judges of different political parties must conduct this process. And so where those activities are, we're gonna have our judges sitting at other ends of the tables, uh, and then verifying the work kind of in the center um, as well. With all this said, our training videos will be available uh, mid-July as well as our reference guides. So we will have all this available to the public for um, public review and our election judges to review. Uh, and then starting on July 17th, uh, all of our election judges who will be serving in all 170 of our polling places across the county uh, will go through their normal training as well as a specific training about these new COVID processes uh, mainly around providing a safe voting experience. Uh, and then we will um, be our judges again ahead of the November election to kind of learn, uh, reevaluate, uh, and implement any additional changes we need to provide that safe voting experience. Uh, and then my, my final slide is just a call uh, to action for all of you who are here. We always need election judges. Uh, elections are 
um, the foundation of our democracy, as Karen had said in her intro. Uh, but they're run by um, they're run by residents. They're run by voters. Um, so our election judges are um, they are paid, but they're essentially volunteers from our community um, that want to make sure that our elections are run fair, uh, that they're accessible, uh, and then that they're accurate and that they're secure. And um, okay. so if you have concerns about providing a safe, secure, accessible, equitable voting experience. Uh, serving as an election judge is one of the best ways to do that. And I will say, I see a handful of our election judges uh, on this call today, so this, that's good to see. Uh, but we always need more uh, election judges. It's a great way to serve your community. Um, and if you want to be involved in maintaining our democracy uh, and seeing that it's successful into the future, um, being an election judge it puts you on the front line of uh, serving our democracy and serving our voters uh, and making sure that our government represents us uh, and we need to do that through voting. So if you're interested in serving as an election judge, it is never too late. Uh, we always need folks to help us. You can call 266-2171 uh, uh, or go to our website, rcelections.org, uh, and sign up uh, to serve as an election judge. The only requirement is that you're an eligible voter uh, and that you complete the training. Uh, and then for those of you who are under 18, uh, if you are uh, in school, you can serve as a student election judge uh, at the age of 16. And so we heavily encourage our students to serve as election judges throughout the county. Uh, and in our experience, some of our best judges uh, have been our students. So if you have uh, students at home or a student yourself, uh, we would very much like to see you serve as an election judge uh, in Ramsey County. And again, it's never too late to sign up. So uh, with that, that's kind of our high level plan and I'll uh, defer it to the question and answer uh, if there's any additional things people would like to know about. But otherwise, uh, thanks for the, the few minutes to talk about uh, what we're doing in elections. Thank you, David. Uh, I'm we're going to open it up to the community discussion question and answering um, period now and uh, the, um, Lydia will be moderating that. So. You're if, you have, oh, if you have questions, can you put them into the chat box so that she can ask the question so that everyone can hear? Lydia, you got to pull yourself off mute real quick. I'm so sorry. I didn't realize I was on mute this whole time. <laughs> Um, hi, everyone. My name is Lydia, and I'm going to be moderating the Q&A portion of our conversation um, today. And if you have any questions that you would like to ask our panelists, you can put it in the chat box, and I'll be reading your questions off for you. And Amy, I did see your question in the chat box, so I will ask it. Uh, yours is the first one that I saw. Um, so Amy said, um, and this is in regards to um, requiring or not requiring the wearing of masks at polling sites. So she said at St. Thomas, voters will be required to wear masks. And it's, um, and this is a question specifically for David. Um, when do the rules of the polling place override the rules of the county? Yeah, good question, Amy. Uh, this is actually a question uh, I'm getting a lot. This is a very common question. I think um, as we go further, we'll probably get this more. Uh, we have uh, pretty strong legal uh, advice from the Secretary of State's office as well as our county attorney um, that we cannot enforce any requirements above the eligibility requirements in state law. Uh, in order to vote in Minnesota, you need to be a U.S. citizen. You need to be 18 years of age. Uh, you need to be a resident of the state of Minnesota for 20 days. Uh, and you cannot be under a court order um, restriction to vote. So if you have a guardianship challenge, a felony, um, you haven't been naturalized, the courts could put that in order. Beyond that, we cannot legally enforce any other requirements in order to exercise your right to vote. Um, so we are going to very much heavily encourage our voters to wear masks, uh, but we cannot make it a requirement uh, because it is not a eligibility requirement in state law. So part of our communication strategy is really to encourage people that um, if you have concerns or you know, are unwilling to kind of meet some of the standards, we would encourage you to vote by mail. But knowing that we can only enforce the eligibility requirements, we are gonna do a lot to make sure that our judges are safe. Um, and I did see a question about plexiglass. I should have corrected myself. At this point, it, we are able to, I believe, procure enough plexiglass for every station 
um, but that is tentative because uh, procuring PPE has been difficult. So our request was for uh, eight per polling location. And for our election judges, that would accommodate the four poll books, two registration judges, two ballot judges and same translation. Uh, but we are hoping to get more uh, if we are able to. Um, so with that said, we can't enforce the eligible, anything above the eligibility requirements, but we can work very hard to make sure that our polling locations are safe. And with that said, we have re-reviewed most of our locations. We have gotten out of any polling location that is a senior living facility. Uh, and we've also reviewed locations to make sure that we, we do have room to spread out. Um, I know for those of you who work in some of our polling places, we do have some pretty difficult locations. Um, and we're really hoping that given all the PPE we're gonna provide, the social distancing standards, um, and um, folks voting by mail, that we can really provide that safe voting experience. Thank you, Dave. Um, in follow up to that, um, I know that there's some concern that um, election judges have about their safety as well because they're interacting with um, a lot of residents. And so um, there's a question from Kathy. Um, how, how are you um, or how is the county planning on putting protective measures in place for election judges while on site? Yeah, you know, one of the difficult things is, you know, elections, if you saw the governor's response or the county manager, you know, elections is always on top of the list of essential services. So we have to maintain our services. But yes, we need to make sure that our election judges are safe. Uh, otherwise, we can't run polling places without our election judges. Uh, so what, what are we doing to make sure you're safe? Again, we are going to require all our judges to wear masks. If you're unable to uh, bring your own mask, we are going to provide every judge with two cloth masks that we believe are much more comfortable. We also are gonna have a small supply of N95 masks available at the polling places for our election judges as well. We will have a supply of shields to wear uh, to cover the eyes or goggles because public health has recommended providing those. Uh, we will be providing a box of gloves in medium and large sizes. Uh, for our election judges to wear, especially for those of you who will be going through the ballots. Uh, gloves obviously can hold the virus, but they're just a good reminder to not touch your face, not touch surfaces. Uh, we are going to be providing isopropyl alcohol wipes to disinfect the poll pads and the voting equipment. We're providing spray bottles to clean down the voting stations after every use. Uh, and we're also providing, um, like I said, the plexiglass shields. Uh, again, the quantity on those is still being worked out, but our hope is to get uh, 10 per polling place. Um, and, and then the social distancing standards. Uh, we are gonna have a greeter. Uh, if, so for those judges on the line here, you'll see in your training, we're gonna have a greeter sitting at the entrance and the exit, and then another one kind of in the polling place. And they're really gonna be there to enforce the social distancing standards. Uh, we're also gonna be providing uh, more tape to put on the ground. Um, so you can put the uh, six, six foot distance markers, as well as we procured the big signage to put at the front and entrance of the polling place to remind voters of the, their expectations uh, when they show up. So that's what we're doing. I guess at that point, if uh, for our electors, if that's not enough protection for you, I would um, just you know reconsider if that's something you're willing to do uh, or give our office a call. And maybe there's other suggestions we haven't considered. <coughs> Um, we're open to every suggestion at this point, um, but that some, there's going to be some responsibility that if you don't feel comfortable serving um, or that you can maintain safety under what I've just explained, um, then maybe I would give our office a call and we can have that conversation if this is something that uh, would work for you. Great. Thank you, David. So there's a question from Carol. Can the polling locations post or distribute information about completing the census? Um, I can I can uh, speak to at least part of that. Um, census operations will um, be completed according to the current schedule um, by October 31st. So the timing wouldn't work to include um, census information at polling locations for the November election um, unless we are including information there for people who come in to do early voting, and we may do that. Um, as for the August election. Um, we can do what we did last time and include some information, uh, census information at the Plato building. I don't know if we'll be able to get um, census information at all polling lo locations. And I would have to talk to uh, David about that. 
Um, there's a question from Peng, um, Peng Vu. Is there any rules or are there any rules against staff encouraging clients to request for an absentee ballot? No, there is no prohibition about anybody soliciting absentee ballots. Um, campaigns do it quite a bit. Uh, you'll see them just the applications sitting around in different, uh, you know, public library, city hall, park and rec. So no, you can definitely encourage that. Um, I think the one reminder is, you, know, you can't just call and say, send me a ballot. We're not just gonna mail anybody a ballot. We get those calls. You have to complete an application, but if you call our office, we'll mail you an application, we'll email you an application, or you can go online and just fill it out. So we'll work with whatever method uh, works best for you. Um, if you want applications uh, for whatever uh, organization, office, or personal reason you want, um, give our office a call and we can make sure that those are provided to you. We have groups actively picking up applications uh, to distribute at different events um, um, daily. So just get a hold of our office uh, and we can make that. We also have a toolkit on our website uh, about voter registration drives. So if you are looking at doing a voter registration drive or an absentee ballot application, just type, uh, we can provide those documents uh, so you can go ahead and do that. Um, there's a question regarding the location of polling places. So um, for in-person voting in November, will, will these locations be limited to certain areas or, all, all, or are all, all polling sites remaining open? So uh, correct me if I'm answering the question uh, wrong, but what I'm thinking I'm hearing is for early voting before election day, any voter in the county can go to any of those locations. Uh, so if you live in St. Paul and you find yourself in um, Roseville, you can vote at the Roseville uh, early voting or absentee ballot location. Um, but on election day, you have to go to your polling place. Um, that is state law. So if you're unsure of where your um, election day polling place is, mnvotes.org, uh, or our Ramsey County Elections website, uh, you can find the poll finder uh, and look up where your polling place is. Or as always, you can call our office and one of our staff persons will uh, look up your polling place. Uh, but for absentee voting, any voter can go to any of the locations. Uh, and for the primary, you saw the locations there. They're also listed on our website, uh, as well as will be uh, kind of communicated out through social media. Uh, but on election day, you do need to vote uh, at your specific polling place. If you show up at the wrong polling places, our election judges um, will use the precinct finder to get you um, to the right location. And are there anticipated to be any changes to existing polling sites for this um, November? Yeah, we have made a few minor changes. Um, those really are to leave our senior living uh, facilities. So state law allows local municipalities to change their polling places July 1st, so obviously we have a few weeks still. Um, for clarification, the county does not select polling places. That is the job of the local municipalities. Um, so if you have concerns with uh, any of your polling places, you can always call my office. We have no problem uh, taking that information, uh, but you can also call your local municipality uh, as well. Um, so local municipalities have until July 1st to make those changes. Uh, given my position, I know uh, when these changes are occurring, uh, of the 170 polling places in Ramsey County, I'm aware of about 10 location changes that will occur. Uh, and that's again, just to leave senior facilities or there's a few high rise apartments who uh, we thought would be great locations uh, given that it would be hard to socially distance. Uh, but with that said, all voters will be notified of any polling location um, via a mailing that will occur at least 25 days before the election. In Ramsey County, we also send out an additional piece because the piece that comes from the state isn't the most user friendly. It's actually pretty hard to find uh, the information. So we send voters in Ramsey County kind of a map, some information if there's special um, things you need to know about that location. And voters can expect to see that around July 13th if their polling place changes. Uh, but for the vast majority of folks in Ramsey County, your polling place will not change. Uh, but with that said, uh, there is a lot still going on. And if we see changes in the pandemic, we might find locations that are unwilling to serve uh, and we will deal with those uh, in our emergency um, statute that allows us to make changes if a polling place becomes unavailable, you know, the day before the election. So, uh, but all voters will be notified and then we do postings at the old polling places. So if you do show up at your own polling 
place, there will be signs uh, directing you to where you need to go. Um, as a follow-up to that, our voting hour is going to be extended. So if, if there are people still in line, will they be able to vote? Yeah, good question. And if you saw kind of what was happening in Georgia yesterday, I'm sure you do have this question. Um, the uh, uh, the uh, It would take a ruling from a judge or the governor to extend hours on election day. My office does not have that authority. Uh, but if we see, you know, we have a lot of lines at uh, getting close to uh, eight o'clock, uh, we obviously will be in contact with the Secretary of State's office to make that recommendation. Uh, but that authority, again, comes from the courts uh, or the uh, governor, not from our office. So at this point, voting is still 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. on election day. Got it. Thank you. I know we have um, a number of folks on the phone. If you have a question you'd like to ask, you can put yourself off mute and ask your question. Is there anyone that has a question they'd like to ask our panelists on the phone? Okay. Folks can continue to put their questions at the chat box as well. Panelists, are, is there anything else that you'd like to add to what you've already shared with our, with our attendees? We will uh, promote a list of all our polling locations. Um, probably the list is out there right now, but we will have the official list um, after July 1st with all the changes. So if you're curious, because I've seen some questions here, uh, if your polling place has changed, but it's not where you live, so you won't get that mailing, uh, you can go on our website uh, and see that total list uh, and get the information uh, about specific polling places there. So we have about 10 minutes left on our, uh, for our town hall. Are there any um, final questions that you have, participants? Lydia, hi, this is Karen. Um, I'm seeing a lot of questions in the chat that haven't been asked of the panelists yet. Um, how are those questions going to be responded to? Um, I think I've been reading through the questions. I know Kaysan has been responding, uh, typing up what the panelists are saying as well. If there are any questions I've missed, Kaysan and Prince, could you let me know or read them out? I would suggest if there's any questions that have not been answered, um, now would be a time where you can pull yourself off of mute and be able to ask those specific questions. My name is Rick and I have a question. Um, I have applied for absentee ballots for both of the upcoming elections in August and November. But with that, can I still not do that, but go in and vote in person at the, uh, I would probably absentee uh, Plato. Can I still do that? Yes, you can. So as long as if, if you, so if we have mailed you, we haven't mailed you your ballots yet. So it sounds like you've applied. So on June 26th, uh, we will send you a ballot if your application was accepted. I don't, you know, I'm not going to ask you your name to look that up. But if your application was accepted, aka we verified that, yep, you are who you say you are and it matches the registration, then we will mail you ballots on June 26th. If you do not want to vote that ballot and you want to come in person, you have a few options. You can either bring that ballot to the Plato office or, Rick, you can come down here. Our records will show, once we look you up, that we have not gotten a ballot back from you. So we will then put a note on that record. So if we do get, and then we'll let you vote there, but if we do get that ballot back from you, our records will say, reject this ballot, because Rick has already come in person and voted another one. Or finally, Rick, if you decide, nope, I don't know who I, you mail me this ballot, but I don't really know who I want to vote for yet. I'm going to wait until election day. As long as you never mail that back to us, when you show up, your record will say you haven't submitted a ballot and we'll let you vote on election day. But if you do mail that ballot back to us, uh, your record will say, yep, you have a ballot. And then you have up until 14 days before the election to say, don't count my ballot. But on 14 days before the election, 
your ballot will be counted uh, and you cannot pull it back. So if you mail that ballot back to us within 14 days and then show up at your polling place, our judges will say that you've already voted by absentee and you won't be able to vote. But if, if you get that ballot on June 26th and that's not the one you want to vote, as long as you don't mail it back to us, you can come in person and cast your vote. Um, David, could you clarify um, one more time? So if someone is in line at 8 p.m., will that person get to vote? Yes, they will. So for our election judges who are here, um, if you follow the tra training, they know that at eight o'clock, which in Ramsey County, knock on wood, we don't have a ton of lines at eight o'clock, uh, but you never know what the future brings. An uh, election judge will go stand out at the end of the line at eight o'clock and anybody who is in line in front of that judge will be able to vote. And we instruct our judges, don't start tearing down the polling place until every voter has voted and left the polling place. So if it's eight o'clock and you still have voters in line, uh, we're going to let everybody vote. But if you show up at 801 and our election judge is in line, uh, you will not be allowed to vote. Um, and that is following what state law says. If you're in line at 8, you have the right to vote. Great. Right. I have one question that was sent to me directly. So for census, are they done with hiring? Um, and is there any follow-up on those who have already applied? So it's my understanding that the, the census has um, indeed uh, offered jobs to all the people that it's going to offer jobs to. So they compiled their pool of applicants and uh, you know, then they determined how many people they would need and then they offered jobs to those people. As for the other people in the pool, um, honestly, I, I asked our local Census Bureau representative this question and he, even he is not sure. Um, we don't know if the Census Bureau is going to get back to you, but um, you can probably rest assured that if you have not been offered a job by now, um, there probably is not a job offer forthcoming. Um, they've got everyone they need now. Okay. okay. Thank you, Jolie. So if there are no more questions, I'm going to hand it over to Prince. It's going to close our town hall. Yes, first of all, I want to thank everyone for joining us uh, for this time. We really do hope that this was informative for you. We really do hope that you got uh, your questions answered. Um, and want to send a special thank you to uh, Karen Francois, our Deputy County Manager for Information and Public Records, um, to Heather, Dave, um, and Jolie for uh, the insight about census and engagement work. Thank you to Lydia for facilitating uh, the conversation. And also thank you to Kao Song for uh, organizing this event um, as part of our racial equity and community engagement action team. And what I wanna be able to do is um, just share some resources with you all. So this town hall will be available on our website um, and we'll send the link out to everyone. Uh, but if you go to ramseycounty.us um, at the top of the website, uh, you will see where it says where uh, COVID-19 information. Once you click on that, you it will take you to this page, which has a ton of information available and resources available, specifically in response to COVID-19, about how we are really delivering our services um, way differently amongst every department in response to this. There's translation material in Spanish, Hmong, Korean, and Somali about COVID-19 information. Um, there is a customer contact center that residents and individuals can call, 651-266-8500. This open from 8 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. And it is a one-stop option for directing and resolving residents' inquiries um, with regards to delivering of services. Um, and this whole presentation will also be available through the website, so you can download it and get all of this information. We offer clinical services, cloud and child and teen checkup services, as well as domestic ab abuse resources. Um, a special plug for financial assistance and that we understand in this time that our residents are going through a lot of uh, hard economic times. There is opportunities available for residents to obtain emergency assistance, um, as well as uh, workforce employment assistance programs that's available as well. Um, Ramsey County does offer mental health resources, food resources, 
Um, and we're doing a lot of work with our immigration, legal defense, and wraparound services so that individuals from our community who are facing those tough times are being able to are being provided the supportive services that they need. Um, we offer technology help um, and there's modified library services. So curbside pickup is available at our Maplewood, Roseville and Shoreview library as well. Um, and with that, we really wanna thank you all for your time. Um, if you have any information or wanna contact us, you can email racial equity at ramseycounty.us as this event is sponsored in partnership with Information and Public Records Service Team and our Racial Equity and Community Engagement Response Team. If you have any additional questions or comments that need follow up on, please put that in the chat box. And we thank you and we appreciate you so much for taking the time, this one hour to spend with us. We do hope that you and your family and your loved ones continue to remain safe. And remember, stay safe, Minnesota. We love you and we appreciate you and thank you all so much.